Bonjour à tous. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. On a toujours vu l'Europe ces dernières années hein, jouer un peu le rôle de précurseur dans la lutte euh, et l'adaptation au changement climatique. Years Mais been a, a trendsetter when it comes to climate change. But there's a new variable in the equation, which is uh, strategic autonomy. With COVID-19, more recently the war in Ukraine, we have obviously breached the limits. Um, we're seeing that we heavily depend on uh, international and global supply chains. During the next hour, we're going to see how we can mobilize European savings to finance a pay for the energy transition while preserving um, Europe's sovereignty and strategic independence. Uh, we have Delphine Damrezit, who is the chairman and CEO of Euronext Paris, uh, Bertrand Badré, who is one of the managing partners and founder of Blue Like an Orange Sustainable Capital, and Vincent Mortier, who's the, who's the CIO, Chief Investment Officer at Amundi. Vincent, I'm going to start with you. We talk a lot about sovereignty, sovereignty and Europe. Europe's strategic autonomy. Obviously, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Ukrainian war has changed things somewhat. How has the role of, uh, of, of, of asset managers changed? Good afternoon. That is a very broad question. I think, for the, for, for, for the record, Europe is the most open economic market, or, or financial market, rather. I think we've had some uh, interesting early warnings about vulnerabilities that the uh, many Europeans, I think, underrated in healthcare, for example. And um, Ukraine really came as the final trigger on defense and energy. Europeans all of a sudden realized at a high price that uh, they heavily depended on others and that time had come to act. In the meantime, Europe uh, had started to invest in the energy transition, so it's all happening at the same time now with huge amounts. We're, we're seeing different kinds of numbers. We're talking about hundreds of billions of euros minimum that should be invested every single year. So the, the question is, how, how are we going to pay for it? Um, I am convinced that the public authorities alone can't do it. They have a role to play, but they can't do it alone. I believe that private organizations have to be involved and, and, and participate and channel the money uh, to make these investments happen. However, um, to do this, uh, several boxes must be ticked. First of all, if we have, if we're going to have pub public-private partnerships (PPPs), we are going to need to have a stable and very regulated environment. There is nothing like volatility, um, where some will be favored at the expense of others. That won't work. Um, the projects that are going to be funded must have some type of. Uh, profitability, some sort of return on investment. We're not talking about funds, uh, about feel-good funds. The, these are funds that must generate some returns at some point. And, and, and we can only attract people if we can convince them that they will generate some money, dividends, or some sort of return at one point or another. And then uh, when you're an asset manager, well, then you need to do your own diligence. You need to be focused. You need to be very serious. You need to work hard on all the projects to analyze them, understand them, decide how, what kind of products you're going to develop, how you're going to support your customers, and so on and so on. And, and only keep the best assets. So as asset managers, we have a, a fundamental role to play. This is not just marketing. Um, we need real content. We need to create value. And um, we need to make real investments in people, infrastructures. Um, we, we're going to have to build, a, build a, a robust ecosystem. Time has come, finally. And we all have a role to play um, for asset managers, uh, investors, uh, the public authorities, um, the private distribution networks, and so on.
Well, thank you for that, uh, Vincent. Delphine, over to you on the energy transition and uh, strategic autonomy. Um, capital markets have been accused to be underdeveloped in Europe uh, compared to the U.S. or, or Asia, uh, where the capital markets are much, much bigger. Um, a lack of equity. Um, some answers have been given by um, capital markets uh, starting in 2014. We had a conversation uh, earlier this morning on the topic during the plenary session. Um, how do you see the market architecture going forward and how can it support the, the next big evolutions and revolutions? And how have capital markets contributed so far in Europe? Well, capital markets, we talk about all the time and sometimes more you, the more you talk about them, um, the more you talk about them, um, but nothing really happens. I would like to come back to the wake-up call um, that came with the war in Ukraine. All of a sudden, as you said before, we discovered that globalization with uh, a highly fragmented, uh, very fluid, um, very smooth uh, value chain where everything was optimized worked very well until something goes wrong, until, some, some, until something breaks in the engine. And, and then all of a sudden you realize you need greater um, strategic autonomy. You can't just expect others to support you. And the same thing is true for capital markets. It's, but, it's, but it's really difficult to imagine this. If you depend on foreign capital, um, the danger is small. But if you depend on foreign players, organizations, it, it, the problem is even more true. Because if there is any type of tension somewhere, well, then people go back to their home base and close the borders. And you're stuck all by yourself or not. And capital markets, if you, to, to, to unite capital markets, you need to federate a market which is historically and naturally fragmented from an infrastructural standpoint, from in terms of rules, and so on. In Europe, so far, we have done a lot of harmonizing. We have rules, common rules, but that, that are variably applied. A lot of countries have kept their own rules and regulations when it comes to bankruptcies, for example. This is also the case in the, US, the, case in the US. Uh, but they have completely unified infrastructures in, in the US. Uh, Europe harmonized its rules, um, behaviors. They've made a real attempt to converge um, without any direct supervision, unlike uh, the, the banking sector. And Europe also strengthened competition. We have all kinds of uh, plat platforms. Um, we have given brokers, uh, you know, the authorization to, uh, to, to, to trade in dark pools and so on, and, and, and prices uh, to a certain extent went down. There was more consolidation. A broker, American brokers, really, you know, took power. Marginaliser les, les, les brokers uh, régionaux. And uh, marginalizing uh, regional brokers. And at the end, well, you have very powerful organizations. So the reason why I'm saying this is because having domestic players, having strong domestic infrastructures is important. They must be powerful. And Elles vont exercer un pouvoir qui vont faire baisser les marges et qui vont provoquer des consolidations. Donc you, très bien, uh, the, the risk is that margins can go down if you, and, and that there is a lot of consolidation. But at the end of the day, you will need champions. You will need big ones. Otherwise, someone else will, will take the lead. So this is what happened. Uh, what you described for Europe is very much what happened in capital markets with, with uh, digital. Instead of consolidating from within, 
We have a system which really goes through aggregation. We have large digital platforms, financial digital platforms and retail and brokers and so on on one side, and then more traditional brokers on the other side. Um, and, and in a somewhat disconnected way. Euronext, we are a pan-European uh, operator, and we are listing all companies, big, small, mid-size, and we trade uh, with all these companies, big, small, mid-size. But you need rules. We need, we need strong rules that make that that can make all this happen. So when it comes to infrastructure and um, integration instead of just competition that is going to eventually make things positive for everyone, it, it doesn't really work that way. Bertrand, uh, first of all, thank you, Delphine. Bertrand, turning to you, um, strategic sovereignty. Um, more and more we talk about national preference um, in terms of supplying, uh, purchasing. Uh, how can we create sovereign Europe's sover sovereignty without becoming protectionist or isolationist? Ah, le micro lâche. Allô? Oui. Euh, non, je, je pense que c'est la question à 10 000 milliards de dollars sur laquelle okay. tout le monde fasse That's, that's a tough question. Um, if you take, if you look back, um, you can see how much of a shock all this has been to us. I, I, when I was working at the World Bank and worked on climate and sustainable development, I had the impression we were entering a new era of, uh, of international cooperation, especially when Barack Obama and Xi Jinping Pins, uh, sh sh shook hands, and that was it. We thought that that was it. And uh, but then, what Delphine described happened: the invisible hand, in agreement with the collective objectives we thought was going to work, and everything was going to go smoothly. But that's not what happened. When they shook hands, it wasn't really the beginning of a new cycle. It was only the end of the previous cycle, um, which started with the. Uh, the fall of the, the, the Berlin Wall, and uh, Russia and China entered the uh, uh, WTO, and, and that was it. Everybody had the same values. Uh, the, you could just apply the same rules across the board with a few footnotes that would apply to everyone, and everything was going to work smoothly. And, and, and it just didn't work out that way. When you look at Germany and, and, and energy, you could you could simply um, abandon nuclear and you know buy from Russia on paper it works. But we've had several wake-up calls, very painful wake-up calls. That they've been very painful for Europe because Europe doesn't really know how to fight back. Uh, Europe needs to cooperate more. Uh, obviously, and is struggling to do so, but we have come to a point where uh, solutions must be found quickly, easy to say, hard to do. Um, so, you know, Voltaire at the end of Candide says you have to, you have to um, grow your garden and cultivate your garden, and and and, and, and that's sovereignty seen from within. Uh, do what you can inside. If you need to see what's happening on the other side, you can peek over the wall. But that's a very bad approach, and I think that Voltaire probably didn't have that in mind. You need a more universal approach, and Europe can do that. We need to mobilize our savings to develop from within, and that's where all the agitation these days is coming from. We need to resuscitate, resuscitate the, the French nuclear industry, for example, and there are many other general interest topics, jobs, um, and so on, and, and all states are very busy working on savings. Um, Janet Yellen said uh, fund shoring. Uh, she said, let's 
le, pardon, le problème, c'est que les copains, ça peut varier. You can just spend time with friends. It depends on what, what kind of friends you have. Um, but uh, I think that in finance, fi finance, the financial world is going to analyze this very, uh, very closely. If you're not a friend, you're going to pay a lot more than a real friend. But look at votes at the UN. Um, some countries allegedly very close to uh, Western Europe, like Senegal, Morocco, Mexico, and a few others said, okay, guys, not my problem. Um, <laughs> so I think that this raises a lot of new questions, and uh, it, it's going to disrupt the way we think about finance. And uh, we, uh, our uh, economic paradigms are, are profoundly changing. The role of central banks is changing changing. So it's a lot of change and it's a lot to digest. And the fear is if the fear of paralysis when we have to be more agile than ever. Now, the, the last word, com coming back to the image of the, of, of the garden with a wall around it. I believe in the garden without a wall, but we're not alone. We can't fix the problems all by ourselves. Uh, objectively, we don't have the resources to do it, so we can't do it alone. And we can also use standards. Um, I, I remember this story. Uh, David Lipton, who was the deputy of, of, of Christine Lagarde at the, the Monetary Fund in Washington, I was having a conversation with him, and uh, uh, you know, in a provocative note, he said, "You Europeans, you guys have two things left." Uh, so that was pretty good. Two things better than nothing. You, you, you're going to have to put taxes on on whatever can be taxed and put regulations where, wherever regulations can be uh, implemented. Uh, GDPR, for example. And um, and he was right. We need standards. Uh, you know, the taxonomy, um, impact standards, and so on. I think that if we we will be stronger if we uh, if we are united. So I think we need to work with emerging countries because they hold some of the solution. The caricature of the relationship with, with we've had with Africa is, is crazy. Um, We've been telling them not to use fossil fuels, but now that something's happening in Eastern Europe, all of a sudden we're back to, to Africa, telling them, asking them to look for natural gas. That is not the right thing to do. Strategically, that is not, it's messy to do that. We've had this massive shock. We need to see what we can do at home, who our allies are, and, 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 and that's it. But we have to stop doing stop and goes. We need, we need to in, invest, and we need to invest together, because it is in our interest to develop those countries. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Bertrand. Uh, I think that's a, a perfect transition with the next question. Two weeks we had uh, a discussion with this over lunch. The European uh, Union uh, signed an agreement to reinforce climate policies in uh, the, the current context on, on of pressure on energy. Uh, the target is carbon neutrality by 2050 and a reduction of GHGs by 55% uh, by 2030. That's the fit uh, for 55, uh, 25, sorry. That is very ambitious. That is going to, to attract a lot of investments, a lot of money. Um, Vincent, do you think uh, Europe's on the right track? We talked about the uh, taxonomy, we have the MIFID, uh, we have uh, a lot of other things. What else can we do to make these products very clear, show that they are indeed um, environmentally friendly tools and, and, and solutions? Well, I think. First of all, I think we have to recognize there is a lot of uh, hope, and, 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 and Europeans are very motivated. But the equation is particularly complex. The, 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 uh, the, the French um, uh, uh, regulator, uh, market, financial market regulator, said, said itself, agreed to the fact that it was very complicated. And, uh, each country wants to have its word to say. Um, each country wants to have local specificities, uh, labels, um, and uh, sometimes specificities are contradictory. So we have spent hours 
literally hours and hours to desiccate, analyze all regulations, and we, we still have not come to the conclusion. Uh, I, I mean, we've done some serious thinking. Uh, so if I'm a retailer or a distributor, I don't know how they can make any sense of this. Uh, understanding all texts, legal texts and regulations, just reading and understanding takes an hour. Some texts, again, uh, contradict other texts. You can't have a high level of taxonomy and have a strong carbon reduction trajectory. That doesn't work um, because these two constraints are opposite. Uh, that would be 1% of the, of the European market cap. The taxonomy is 5%, and that's, that's already very little. So regulators have not reached out to uh, the parties they should have reached out to. And um, some countries are saying two years from now everything will be different and we are not going to apply uh, European Europe's current regulations. That's the situation. Some customers are really wondering. Um, some customers are saying, wait a minute, uh, can you be ESG and work in defense? Uh, yeah, the answer is maybe yes, but you have to explain why. Some say no. So, again, the approach and the, uh, the answers are not always the same. And the more volatile the situation, the more complicated it will be to convince investors that this is serious and that this is not just marketing or product placement. So I, I think we have a long path, a long road ahead of us. And I, we have been calling for a, a genuine dialogue between all stakeholders to come up with something stabler with a more consistent and homogenous approach, approach across European countries. The second thing I would like to say is that Europe is making the same mistake it's, it has made before in terms of sovereignty. If you look at Reddit, uh, credit uh, or rating agencies, they're all American. All market data companies are American companies. Uh, indices, except for a German one, are all US-based. And all rating, yeah, almost. Sorry, the big ones, the big ones. Americans widely dominate the industry. That was my point. And ESG rating organizations, there again, there are two big leaders, and again, they happen to be Americans, MSCI and Morningside. Um, you know, it's again a question of sovereignty. Because uh, when you look at what happens inside these uh, index providers, rating agencies, uh, first of all, they're very powerful. Uh, more and more they work with investors. And a lot of the uh, the, 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 the values they, they, they manage, uh, they, they, they rate, um, are American ones. And, and the American ones are rated better than Europe, European assets. And, 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 and Europeans don't seem to mind. You know, what they really want is to tick the box. I, I, I'm, I have my rating. I'm compliant. Let's move on to the next thing. So once again, we are asking for uh, either a, a, a public or a private alternative, European alternative. And um, let's, we, what we don't want is to be caught between China and, 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 you, and the US when it comes to data and how data is processed. This is a question of absolute sovereignty. And I'm very surprised that the, the regulators so far have not really paid attention to this. Delphine? I, I don't really, what else to say? I think that I can only echo what uh, um, was just said now by Vincent. Um, I think 
we need there is also a lot of uh, a lot of this is political um, we have to be realistic if it's not really re realistic uh, you're not relevant um, and if you can't apply things well then they will never be applied we've created a lot of expectations and we've made a lot of promises to the general public and if we don't keep these promises, then there will be a lot of confusion. So that worries me. Um, I think uh, uh, we also, uh, you know, I recently read this sh very short article on um, ethics, uh, two categories of uh, uh, ethics officers. And uh, ethics officers decide they invest in what's clean, decarbonated, nothing else. So they're very selective, and uh, there is some hypocrisy behind that, because you could sell uh, to other people. Quel est l'impact de ça? On peut se dire en réalité, oui, j'ai renchéri le coût. Euh, le coût de, euh, de financement de ceux que, que je n'ai pas financé, mais ça ne marche pas comme ça parce qu'il y a encore plein de gens. Et it creates a very a very complex picture. Très peu marqué et donc il n'y a pas d'impact. Et puis les, les conséquentialistes, ce serait plus gens qui s'intéressent à l'impact, qui vont avoir une sorte d'activité. Then you have people who will be looking at the impact, the others who will be looking at the impact. If you invest, what's the impact? If is there a positive or negative impact, and so on. So and then the second thing I wanted to say is that the system based, the current system is based a lot on reporting. And it's a question of values, really, at the end of the day. But it's difficult to measure, especially climate. It's not that simple. Um, we measure certain things. We measure how well companies meet standards and stick to standards. So that, that calls for a lot of commitments. I'm not saying commitments are not good, but commitments are, you know, generate a lot of heaviness. Um, Companies spend a lot of time, will spend more and more time reporting. And, and again, they, they have to. This is not just about greenwashing. But the system, uh, the ESG system, is somewhat biased in a sense. An investor once told me getting the ISR standard is pretty easy. You keep only the big ones. And so the only correlation there is is the correlation of size. The bigger you are, the more you can do the reporting and, and all the paperwork. So that's a dangerous bias. Now, that doesn't mean one shouldn't do anything. What we do, and as I mentioned earlier on, uh, regarding the indices, and this is something that we're developing a lot, and we are working with uh, uh, banks for a number of uh, customized products. And uh, we produce historical indices uh, uh, for example, CAC 40, AEX for the island, and we're making a shift towards ESG. This was really impact because the customers asked for this and had a reason for this, and they had things uh, migrate all the uh, investments towards these new indices. And there's a, a quarter of the volume for the CAC 40 um, are now being transitioned to ESG. Um, and uh, there's an analysis of best in the class. And we are answering the customers' uh, demands or requests. And there's a tendency in the system to work uh, through exclusion. Uh, that would be on the side of people who are more focused on ethics. Now, we've decided to really focus on things because we don't want to exclude too much. Yeah. And in the end, you will end up with no one if you're too exclusive. And also, you tend to uh, focus on areas where there are no problems. There are 
companies that have no problems. Well, they are in sectors that are not exposed. Those who are in sectors very much exposed, they have to invest a great deal in this. Those who are in sectors which are very much concerned by ESG have a whole discourse. There are number of companies that aren't impacted and find themselves with a bad rating because they don't address the, the, these issues. So all these biases we have to be aware of, and we have to develop products that are um, take on board all these aspects. And uh, um, we have a great deal of expectations as to a maximum of exclusions and uh, of virtuous behavior, but it's not necessarily going to have the impact that is needed. So, how to maximize uh, savings uh, being invested in these products? As uh, we tend to say there's a real European leadership in this area, and we're quite proud of uh, our program and all the things we do. And it's true. We say a number of things, and we do a certain number of things. We walk the walk as well. But there are a number of risks have been uh, mentioned by Vincent and Delphine. Um, one thing I ex uh, said earlier on is that you would tend to uh, have a kind of inclusive, resilient capitalism that protects us from all our neighbors, and that we're going to enlighten the world and hope the world will follow us. But that's a risk. That entails a risk. You know, it, it, and, you know and, and you're going to have some countries like African countries say, come on, it's, it's not good enough. You have to help us uh, transition, and uh, we're not going to be able to follow the same path as you. So we can be very offensive, but uh, and there is, as Vincent said, there's a handicap. And uh, uh, in the past, I said, we are going to be had, because in ESG, it's not what's so important. What's important is, uh, like in the gold rush, is uh, uh, selling uh, the tools, the indices, the different measures. And very clearly, they said this. And uh, having the tools, we're going to be dispossessed today. We find ourselves dispossessed today. And people begin to think that there are technical issues for experts. No, it's got nothing to do. It's not. It's something that has to do with values. And it's something that should be discussed. Uh, I would prefer it to be discussed uh, in Parliament and not just by the rating agencies. It should be discussed democratically. Concerning the price of carbon, that's universal. But in other topics, it isn't universal. Questions of governance, for example. Who's going to decide uh, and make these decisions? And we've somewhat lost control of all this. And something that frightens me today is in the United States. Uh, um, in view of the midterms, the Republicans are very much in protest against what we're talking about. In France, when you're being accused of greenwashing in, uh, in the U.S., people are aggressed because the people say, you're doing greening. So you see Republicans say e e ESG should mean ensuring sound growth. And they're saying, let's get back to fundamentals and forget all these complex rules that you're imposing on us and all these works. And there's a paradox. Uh, they're going to sell tools to us, continue to sell s tools to us, but whilst being uncertain about the substance behind this. So, so Europe mustn't uh, find itself in such a problematic situation. We have capacity, and uh, it's true we know how to regulate, and sometimes uh, uh, it can be perceived as being uh, excessive. But I would say we have to uh, reach out to the developing countries, because with them we can build things 
where there's no, there's the European model, the American model, the Chinese models, and the Chinese American models are not necessarily very attractive for emerging countries. So I think we should really um, reach out to the emerging uh, countries. Okay. Bertrand. Now, if we come back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the discussion that Vincent raised at one point in time to finance this transition, energy transition, public and private investors have to work together. You've been on both sides. So how can private-public partnership work? It's not how can it function. It's not how it's, uh, we have to make it function because we haven't a choice. Now, when it comes to the commitments, the Paris uh, commitment, there is uh, one commitment, number 17, which was partnership. It's not the government on its own, on its own, and it's not the private sector on its own. So that's been said, but not much has been done so far. This is one of the problems. And why is that? Well, there are re ideological reasons. The, uh, we've come out of COVID. Uh, um, and before, there was the other tendency, whereas government was not considered a solution. Now, it's not an easy, because there's a certain amount of suspicion on both sides. In a world where um, the people who focus on ethics have taken over a lot of control, uh, makes life more complex. And there's suspicion about corruption, of bureaucracy, of uh, uh, things being slowed down. And I have urged the World Bank so we have to develop more and more public-private partnerships. And, and uh, sometimes uh, we tend to forget certain uh, good initiatives and leave them by the wayside. I think we have to make a strong effort that we should stop uh, doing this, simply having blended finance on one side and uh, false guarantees on another. We have a whole series of things, but we're incapable of scaling up. And the key to all this is how do we scale up? How do we start real public-private partnership that doesn't uh, generate any suspicions or um, you know, where people are saying, oh, we're privatizing certain profits and then we're uh, nationalizing um, uh, losses and so on. No, we should um, give uh, the possibility to scale up, to go from one operation to 100 operations. Once we've done one operation and it's been successful, we continue to the next. I, uh, you know, I've discussed this very often. People say, yes, it, this is great. Public-private solution is the solution. And we leave and everybody said, this is brilliant. Uh, we've got this wonderful program. And they come back the next year. What happened? Nothing happened. And don't, uh, I don't have the figures. I think there are fewer and fewer public-private partnerships. That's pity. Um, it's absolutely essential. The energy issue will be solved with public-private partnerships and civil society, because civil society has to hold uh, public and private uh, stakeholders to account. Um, so, you know, you have to walk, talk. Uh, you said you were going to do it, you have to do it. And so this is something that we really insisted on at home. And each time there's an obstacle, we decided to uh, develop a partnership to be able to unlock the potential of the market. One last question before handing you the floor, if you have any questions for our panel. Let's try and uh, conclude with a little optimism. I wanted to ask you is there one reason that we'll be able to succeed in mobilizing this capital and succeed in um, developing this uh, energy transition and ensuring uh, European sovereignty in the area? There is uh, uh, a great deal of uh, savings potential in Europe. Uh, that is often in um, life insurance policies and that can easily be um, deployed uh, uh, to invest in slightly more risky operations. 
If we look at portfolios uh, between Americans, Asians, and Europeans, uh, it's interesting to note that savings can be redirected towards other investments. And this is interesting because there's substantial amounts in Europe. There's uh, also people are very much aware of these problems. And if we can create the right products, ensure the transparency, and uh, develop awareness, I think we can convince customers gradually to uh, put their savings in these products. It will take time, however. And we have to work uh, uh, very uh, efficiently and uh, to make sure that we hold the course of the long term. But I'm optimistic because we have a lot of money that we can find to invest. So, Delphine, two things. A second positive thing I have thought of. The first thing is that the European paradigm has evolved. One time when I started in the profession, there was, I think we could say we're liberal in terms of econ economics. We believe in a market economy. Europe, uh, with the Commission historically, they had the mantra saying we have to open up the market and everything will have be fine. And others, who are on the contrary, are protectionists who want to uh, really, uh, in fact, are uh, foolish. The 2008 crisis, uh, the COVID, Brexit, and Ukraine has made things change a great deal. Now, that doesn't mean that we should be protectionist, uh, foolishly protectionistic. Now, we have European politicians that even the French didn't dare to say 10 years ago. So we have evolved. It doesn't mean that we found the way, found the way of doing things intelligently. It's not an excuse uh, to be bad managers, but uh, there has been a change of attitude. That's important. Another thing. Ah, yes, I've, the, most, the, the positive aspect I wanted to talk about. We do have, when we talk about financing, there are, can be a number of problems, but we do have projects and we do have the companies. And we have a, a number of interesting companies that are growing. People who have stayed in Europe to develop these businesses, who have ambition for this continent, who are there. And that's really important that there should be this appetite, this aspiration, and international investors come here who might leave during negative crisis periods. Um, Earlier on, they said that in 2000, there was the internet bubble and everything stopped in uh, Europe and said, That's, we won't do that again. And then there was a sort of much more protectionist attitude. In the US, they decided to purge all that and start it up again. And I hope we will do the same thing because we have a lot of energy. We have companies that are very motivated that are really eager to move forward. I think this should help uh, to convince uh, people who have savings to invest. I was really surprised to see that Europe has put 50 percent uh, deposited more green patents, 50% more green patents than America, and more than China. So we really have a huge pool for manufacturing, uh, in uh, innovation in manufacturing and uh, entrepreneurship. We have a segment that federates uh, technological uh, uh, sectors of our uh, European markets. We've calculated the index, uh, the index uh, of the last five Five years and benchmark this uh, your next tech leaders 110 companies over five years more than 96 percent compared to the Nasdaq 195 and Nasdaq is uh, driven by uh, Google Amazon Facebook etc we have uh, some fine enterprises and we're having trouble evaluating them we're much more critical we should promote uh, ourselves better what makes us optimistic is that we're getting closer uh, 
into uh, the hard obstacles. And uh, Europe is very good at surpassing itself. So I think this uh, awareness that is developing that is going to authorize people to do a number of things. I think that's positive. Now, it's a bit the art of the puzzle. Um, we've worked at puzzles during COVID. We've had, we've never had so much money because we've been talking about these savings for years. For years, we've said we have to get savers to invest their savings. I don't know what is the best method, but there is the money is there. Technically, there is money, there are technologies, there are institutions. We have all the parts of the puzzle. Theoretically, we should be able to do it. There's this something, little something that is leadership and cooperation that's going to enable us to scale up and move on to the next stage. We should be optimistic. We have everything we need. We're beginning to feel that we're our backs are up against the uh, wall, or we can hear, feel the dragon's breath of the uh, Russians. But the circumstances, as has been in the past, is going to urge us to uh, take these steps forward. And I think we're going to continue in this direction. So on the whole, I'm uh, rather optimistic. Um, this discussion, I find, is very interesting. And this discussion, we wouldn't have had it three or four years ago. Uh, the gas market was fantastic, you know, and everybody was buying gas from the Russians. Now we're moving in another direction. I hope Bertrand will not say that uh, Bertrand would say that we have panels that don't want to be uh, uh, discussing uh, with on about uh, economic uh, sovereignty. Well, I could very well be critical in the future. Everybody was saying that uh, uh, that uh, the scene is hotting up, and it's maybe due to the climate change. And but this has changed mindsets. Do you have any questions for the panel? I'd like to ask three questions, if I may. Should I start with the easiest or the most difficult? Well, choose the most difficult one for Vincent, if you like. How to build uh, the attribution of assets with EDF? Uh, how can ESG criteria be taken into account in the management of assets? How can we integrate it in a solution for uh, the attribution of uh, portfolios? We'll answer one by one. It's a very good question. Passive management in such has uh, in the States a little less in France, in States for uh, fiscal reasons, a bit less in Europe has experienced growth because of its simplicity and its low cost. But choosing an ETF is an act if you have to choose the index or the indice. And there are many indices that are available, ESG or, or not. With, and there are many different variations and there are certain indices that are rather exotic. And the key is to understand how the indice is built, how is ESG is integrated. And, um, for example, Euronext indices, which are not, not exclusive, but rather best in class. Other providers are going to be more in working with exclusion. The biggest providers with binary choices are extremely abrupt. In one day to the next, they decide that certain investments are going to come out of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the rating. So. You have to know how the indice has been uh, developed, what are the assets. Uh, um, now, ESG, finally, the indice is going to use data which needs to be understood. Uh, 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 needs to be understood, you know, otherwise if you have garbage in, you have garbage out. So if you're managing only based on indices, it's not necessarily a problem. But it needs, to, and it is in fact an uh, uh, active uh, uh, system. Uh, afterwards, you have a system to uh, manage it in a passive manner, but initially it's uh, active. I wouldn't 
have this opposition between passive and active. The fact of choosing an indices is an active decision. If you take four different indices, you will have four different types of performances. Some want to have uh, something that is more weighted more for one sector or one uh, country. When I, I was at one time was working, at, I was at Matignon, and the president at the time was saying, d d d "We want to have a policy of uh, supply or demand." He said both. Well, we like active. Uh, management. We like also passive management. You're right, Vince. The active investing is active, but the management is passive. But we have to find a balance, because if everyone is passive, the price is no longer decided by people who are going to have, be actively uh, picking stock. And, uh, and once again, passive management ha is simple, and it can also uh, have, provide a multiplying factor, which is very powerful, and which is understandable for customers. And if we don't have a passive uh, management, you know, then you have to realize that, well, clients will be, look at life insurance more, you know. Now, we know that people are not all necessarily adept at uh, picking their stock um, and, and need to be helped. But with passive uh, uh, situations, you have sometimes you have just followers and it's difficult to set a price. Or we don't manage to set a price. So it's important to have an active management with stock picking. And sometimes uh, we um, sometimes criticize uh, uh, traders for being too passive. I think. I think one can have the two. Yes, indeed. Second question. With what extra financial aspects is that are going to be uh, used for uh, an enterprise or for. I didn't understand the beginning. So, ESG, can it generate financial performance? We're persuaded. We're convinced. In a given sector, we reason on a best-in-class basis. We're never going to exclude a complete sector. And companies which have the best trends or the best ESG approach in the past generally perform better. There's a, uh, an effect of supply and demand because there, there's more interest for a company that has a good rating and has a good ESG uh, image. And simply the fact uh, of having this extra demand tends to lead to a higher performance. We see this with uh, on bond markets as with the share markets. Now, this is something that has positive impact in the short term. The long term, uh, that's another question. but. But we note that companies that are aware and invest in this area, in ESG, generally have operational performance, which is, uh, uh, which is good, and they prepare for the future in certain given sectors. Now, the question is between different sectors, and we saw during the first half of the year, the only place where you had positive performance was oil and gas and defense. All the rest was losing or declining. Or, uh, when you have a best-in-class approach, you exclude nothing, and things usually go well. You can beat the index, but if you have an exclusive approach, it's more difficult. So approaches which are very exclusive tend to introduce biases and are not necessarily adapted, in my point of view, from my point of view, uh, for the general consumer market. It's really more for a niche market. We do not recommend uh, an exclusive approach for the uh, consumer market. There are people who want to focus, uh, for people who want to focus on a specific area. We can generate performance via ESG through risks as well. 
ESG is a risk factor as well. By avoiding uh, companies that are going to be controversial in the future, you avoid companies that will have a, a big decline in their stock market value because of ESG risks in the future because of their behavior. Are there any other questions? We can maybe take a last question. You had a third one. Yeah, oh, you had a third one. Look, so let's continue. For the third question, what is the role to obtain higher performance compared to the European share markets towards a long term by using the dynamics of European uh, assets or values? This is Vincent. How can you perform in terms of indices using European values? <laughs> And we're not here to give investment uh, uh, rec recommendations for investments. <laughs> what about Amundi shares in Euronex? Yes, we have a pretty good uh, yield. No, my only advice it may be considered as foolish, but I would say you always need to understand what you're buying. If you don't understand the business model, how the company manages its cash, uh, the questions concerning the quality of the management or uh, suspicion you should avoid. Uh, and there are too many companies today, namely in the U.S., not only in the U.S., in Europe too, that have business models which are difficult to uh, value and are very uh, that have very expensive stock on the market and those are traditional uh, uh, companies uh, Amundi is an example you're next as well with the have dividend yields at five six sometimes twelve percent Cofes, one of our clients has has a dividend yield of twelve percent which is not bad it wasn't a recommendation. <laughs> Careful, I wasn't making. I wasn't on this panel. No, well, it's always the same thing. You have to invest regularly and to know uh, for what uh, term, on what term, or for what uh, outlook. Yes, it's good time the market. It's complicated. When is the high point and the low point? Uh, one last question at the back of the hall. Thomas Rocoful at Partners. I want to come back on the topic of financial uh, information and the uh, issue of sovereignty. I believe we all agree. But as a user, what would you be ready to do uh, in, in practical terms as a representatives of uh, uh, users? This is for Mr. Mortier. Um, there are two things. As a user, we collectively, we pay a lot to the providers. With all this money, we can use this money to pay another provider. We could finance other things, and now the uh, supply has to be there. These providers, established providers, have a real, a real step ahead. And it's difficult to not uh, rely on them. But the mass paid out when I talk about when I talk to my uh, competitors and colleagues, when we compare the figures, they're colossal amounts. M MICAs, uh, for example, there are many other providers. So the next step would be to have uh, take initiatives between private players. I know the banks look at this at one time for the data markets to, to um, put, uh, make available their execution data available. It was a good idea in principle. No. No. We have to be responsible in terms of uh, value change so that the emerging business models or European business models, which are sometimes not so robust, should be able to survive. Because we're all under pressure to reduce costs. Now, we shouldn't uh, uh, lament ourselves when we uh, see that certain uh, players pull out. We've always been encouraged. We uh, demutualized the system 
And this had consequences. So for an individual um, player, it has to decide alone to uh, remain in with the frame of mind of a mutualizing or pooling. So that's why we need public-private. The incentives shouldn't be too virtuous, and then in the end you're perfect, but then you've uh, shot yourself in the foot and and we should make sure that important players should be responsible because they can really change things. Uh, that's in research, but there are other sectors as well. In Euronext, we work this way because we tended to have systems for the trading part to be favorable to the big uh, players. So we had to be careful to to uh, ensure that we have a wider customer base. Otherwise, things evolve uh, in such a way as you find yourselves with a, a market situation that uh, changes. That's where uh, sovereignty is also uh, helping local players. We've finished. Thank you very much to all three of you. I hope that Bertrand will not complain about this panel three years later. Well, Vincent and I will no longer be there. I Merci à nous. Merci à nos panélistes. On va changer de registre.